physical part of football is still the most important part. When you have two teams that know what they're doing and two teams that have great athletes on both sides, then usually the game is decided by the team that hits the hardest. Before you do anything in football, you've got to be able to move from spot A to spot B to hit somebody. Now, once you get there, you want to get there with the most velocity and the most power and the most impact. The rules for playing the game of football allow for a tremendous amount of, uh, of collision. And this is a collision sport, it's not a contact sport. If you lose the battle of the hitting, I'm not sure you're going to win the other battle either. I'll tell you what you better do, I can watch you, you're walking around out there with your finger up your ass, and you ain't hitting the damn throat. The name of the game, man, is hit. It's still a physical game, let's face that fact, and it always will be. That's what makes people want to play this game, because it is a physical game. It's not touch tag. Let's call it what it is. It's violent, and it's physical. <laughs> When a guy gets hit and his headgear comes, pops off, that's part of the game. And that's what people pay money to go see, the great hits. Like the history of war, the history of pro football has shown us that strategy cannot succeed without strength. The first pros resembled raw recruits, eager for combat. They lacked polish, but not spit. These flinty-eyed fighters evolved into the fierce free spirits of the 1950s. While the wild-eyed warriors who played the game were often defanged, they never lost their taste for contact. And like a popular rock and roll song of the period, pro football featured a whole lot of shaking going on. Every Sunday, the NFL offered a crunch course in a school of hard knocks where brawn was emphasized over brain. Some sought shelter behind the referee's shirt tails, but the men who wore stripes on the field were no match for men who often behaved like they should have been wearing stripes off the field. I could do things on the field that I enjoyed doing that I would probably be put in the pokey for if I weren't on the field. Well, not that I, you know, I'm a flat criminal, but it, it was a, a way of expressing yourself. Fighting, scratching, and kicking were common forms of self-expression. Leg whipping was one of several ploys that are outlawed today, but were acceptable during the 1950s. Grabbing the face mask was another. Defensive aces held all the cards. The ball was not whistled dead until the forward progress had stopped. Not his knee touching the ground. So they were you know, free game, but it was kind of open season. 
if they fell down and were rolling and scratching, you know, trying to get some yardage, right, you would, they would open up on it. That was the only enjoyment linemen would ever have during the whole game. <laughs> From the 1950s to the mid-60s, the NFL was not exactly a league of gentlemen. Many players had served in World War II or Korea, and most still had plenty of fight left in them. Few surrendered easily, and it took devious methods to send them to the bench. The dictum, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was as relevant to the NFL as it was to biblical times. I never would accept anyone hit me illegal. Now, when that happens, then you must serve justice. Um, and if you don't know how to serve justice, then you're going to get kicked around the league. You never hit the guy back. You hit him first, because invariably, the noise or commotion that it creates gets the attention of the referee. And then by the time he looks around, he's catching the other guy. The trick is to hit first, but never hit back. You got time. You get next year, next game, whatever. Like guided missiles, players carried heavy payloads, and they used their bodies to launch retaliatory strikes with devastating effect. One of the most unforgettable tackles in NFL history occurred in 1960 when Eagles linebacker Chuck Bednarik hit Giants halfback Frank Gifford. Concrete Charlie made quite an impact. Bednarik's hit on Frank was the greatest tackle I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I used to stay up at nights thinking about hitting a guy like that. Frank was not looking at Bednarik. He should have been looking for him because Charlie could hit, and it, something's got to give, and it was Frank. Like a cheap shot? Well, it really wasn't. I mean, Bednarik, uh, had he given me a cheap shot, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, he was he just a good, solid football player, and a great football player. During the 1950s, football players had to be solid in order to remain standing in a savage world where only the strong survived. There wasn't that much dirty play. It was rough. Yeah, they were rough. They, if they could kill you, they'd kill you, honestly. OK? But nothing dirty. Nothing wrong with drawing a little blood here and there, you know, what the heck. And I like to think that with that approach to the game, attack, 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 I walked out totally unmarked. And I think that that record in itself, 14 years in the pros and four in college and three in high school, is second to none. I have no scratches, no marks and nothing but a bleeding heart. I think you can coach people to be pretty good tacklers, but I don't know if you can coach people to be great hitters. I think it's an instinct and something that they're blown, born with, that tremendous explosion they have right at the, the point of impact. The old saying is, uh, if they don't bite when they're puppies, they're not usually going to bite. And, uh, I think when you get a young player and uh, a guy that comes up and uh, in high school he's a pretty good hitter or in college he's a pretty good hitter, uh, comes into professional football and it just carries forward. By the time they get to pro football, I think the only thing you control in terms of contact teaching uh, is the emotional side of it. I think if a player is a very intense guy or the organization becomes more intense on Sunday, the more intense you are, the more apt you are to be a heavy hitter on Sunday. You have to mentally make yourself ready to go out and realize that it's such a physical game that, you know, it's be better to be the, the hitter than the hitty. Nowhere in the NFL is this philosophy practiced more than in the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, an international showcase for athletic achievement for five decades. Everything from Super Bowls to Olympiads. Today, it belongs to the Los Angeles Raiders. No team in professional sports intimidates opponents more effectively. 
and no member of this team is more relentless in his intimidation than defensive lineman Howie Long. The Raiders, I show up at camp. They didn't ask me to, to, to bench any weight. They didn't ask me to do any vertical jumps. They didn't ask me to do any broad jumps. They didn't ask me to hop in a think tank and see how my bad dreams were. They gave me a helmet, you're going to play defensive line, and I started to play. I didn't know how to get to the quarterback, so my one move was just come off the ball and run everyone over. And if that didn't work, I tried to fight them. But they called me caveman because they just liked the way I attacked people. My background in football knowledge was so limited that uh, they would be going over terminology such as uh, out of east eye right, triple slot left. Uh, and immediately I started looking around the room like, you know, is anyone else picking this stuff up? You know, or am I the only one that's not getting this? And it turns out I was like the only one that wasn't getting it. They had to literally take me from square one to where I am now. A surprise second round draft choice from Villanova has matured into the game's most menacing defensive presence. When you start to draw up plays, you are conscious of where he is. And you are conscious of saying, we have to do something about this guy or he may destroy what we're trying to do in the game. He's used it left defensive end, left defensive tackle, nose tackle, right defensive tackle, right defensive end. The most dominant force in defensive football today. No one is immune to his greatness. For long, attacks from all five defensive line positions. Instead of one offensive lineman preparing for me, all five have to prepare for me. They never know where I'm coming from. He has that knack of gathering himself and getting into the offensive blocker and at the same time continuing to move toward the quarterback. A lot of defensive linemen start playing games with the offensive tackle and they don't make progress toward the quarterback. But everything that Howie Long does is done toward the quarterback. The ultimate team player, Long often ties up a trio of enemy pass blockers to make way for a teammate. As long as I hear Matt Millen on the tackle or Bill Pakel on the tackle or Sean Jones on the tackle, as long as someone is making the tackle and it's not for a big gain, then I can get up from the bottom of the pile and figure I did my job. You can be a total player and an unselfish player and not necessarily a big statistical player and be a success and be considered to be one of the best at what you do. Here's the rush. He's hit as he throws. Intercepted by Stacey Coran, the 25, the 30, the 40, left side 50. But hard-nosed Howie is not without a sense of humor. Take, for example, the time he invaded the Seattle Seahawks offensive huddle and walked off with their water bottle. I was a bit frustrated, and our water boys are like, you know, the rest of the team. They're just, you know, they were probably talking to someone up in the stands during the timeout, and we hadn't gotten any water out. So I walked into their huddle and took their water from their water boy and said, uh, you know, give me that bottle. They, uh, they really don't deserve it. They hadn't done anything today. You know, it was all in a joke, really, you know I mean? They kind of liked it. For Howie Long, the thrill of the kill is secondary to the challenge of the chase. I haven't seen many quarterbacks maiming people, so, you know, I, I think they're kind of a, an afterthought. I think the justification and the real, real moment of 
glory is when you beat that man in front of you to get to the quarterback. And if a quarterback's not too squirmy about it, I really don't try to hit him that hard. I'm not a violent type of person, you know. I really, I, I appall violence. It just makes me ill. Uh, it's right up there with beats. Ugh. I really just don't like violence, but you know, sometimes, you know, they hit that switch, you know, and it just, uh, I get that kind of, they call it Howie time. My teammates call it Howie time, you know, and I, I kind of get that far away look where I see through people. When Howie Long lapses into his particular brand of tunnel vision, there's rarely any light at the end of it for Raider opponents. He's a guy that you hate to play against him, but from a coach's standpoint, you admire the guy and just wish he was on your football team. Elwick setting up, big rush coming. He's buried for the third sacking of the day. Might have fumbled. He did. Raiders recovered. Raiders recovered. Elway was just snowed under. There was too much defensive push. If you take everything into consideration, both run and pass. Howie Long's the best defensive lineman in football. Howie Long, quintessential crunch time. The key to it is hustle. If I don't hustle as much as I should have during a game, I go home at night and I really, really lose a lot of sleep over it. I like to think of myself as being relentless. You know, I like to be thought of as being that way, relentless. I like that word. A pro football field is a crunch course that is filled with danger zones. In football, it's knock the man down or be knocked down, especially for the fearless hitmen who cover kickoffs. Their mission is simple. Hit anything that moves. I like to hit the ball here and hopefully cause a fumble turnover or something like that. But uh, if, uh, you know, if I can't get to him, I'm going to hit somebody. I'm not going to run 40 yards without hitting somebody. When you get hit by these guys, it's like getting hit with a freight train. These guys know how to, to put every ounce of energy and force behind their tackle or, or the blow they deliver. One yard line, Kid's up the middle behind the wedge, the 15 and is he ridden down. I think there's an awful lot of courage involved. But I like to go back to the men uh, of the 101st and the 82nd Airborne. They said, describe courage. And they said, they're the guys that are afraid, but they go anyway. Those who operate in this danger zone have elevated tackling to a punishing science. Another area of high impact is the line of scrimmage. It is called the pit, an area not much bigger than a closet. Yet within its confines is the game's most heavily weighted struggle. In spite of all the specialization, in spite of all the attention that the quarterbacks get, the game is really played up front, uh, more or less right in the trenches, uh, as everyone says. Because when you assume and gain control of that part of the field, it allows you to do what you want to do. It's not so much who gets across the other side the first, it's the force and the power and the balance and the ability to dominate the man after you make contact. It's a physical combat area. It's not like playing in space. It's not like being detached and running down the field to catch a football. It's not like a linebacker taking a drop and squaring up, playing a ball when it's in the air. This is hit, hit, hit on every play. Oh, 
<laughs> but offensive players are like brain surgeon type. They're very careful and they, they you know, they think things out. Defense, you're a step behind, you have to be over aggressive. You have to attack this man, keep taunting him, come at him, and then go. Once you get clean and you see this quarterback, you don't carry anything else around you, you go right for him and get a good grip on him. It's a clash of wills between the offensive line and the defensive line. One player ends up on top or on bottom by the end of the game. The press never writes about it. Nothing is really said about it, but I think both players generally know who would like to have played football for another quarter and who wouldn't. The line of scrimmage, a no man's land that devours players like the Bermuda Triangle swallow ships. Players have also been known to disappear in the middle of a zone pass defense. When you come over the middle and you're a guy who only weighs 175 or 180, I think you really do, you take your life in your hands because there are some tremendous shots going on in there. <laughs> person individually names his certain area. I call it the pay dirt area. If he's gonna catch it, make him pay for it. There's just a certain knack that we have where we can just anticipate when that ball's gonna hit his hands and then we're gonna make contact right as soon as it touches his hand. Just as there are ways to intensify a hit, there are also methods to lessen the impact. One thing that we learned early in Bill Walsh's offense is to, to read the defense. If it's a zone, sit down. It's, it's not very complicated. Just sit between the two guys and catch it and turn up field. When you're going across the middle, man to man, you just keep running across because there's uh, you know, nobody there going to meet you. If it's a uh, zone defense and you keep running through it, you're going to get hurt because there's going to be somebody there waiting for you. A uh, key example was you know, when Ronaldo got hit in the Atlanta game. He read it too soon. He thought it was man to man and he kept running. It was a zone and the guy was sitting there waiting for him and it, you know, it cost him. It hurts a lot more when you uh, don't catch the ball. So you should catch the ball. Sometimes you feel when you make a, a halfway decent catch and you say, you get hit, take a good shot, and get up and say, hey, now I got him thinking. I can take it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a battle of the minds. A football field is a hazardous runway, and those who navigate it must endure many crash landings to earn their wings in the NFL. Well, a critical part of football is hitting the other man before he's ready for it. And it's just like boxing. If you can beat the man to the punch, even if it's by a quarter of an inch, you've got him beat. So if you're beating the other man to the punch, you're going to win. Beating a defense to the punch can instantly turn the tables for an offense. However, the ability to strike first requires an aggressive attitude. I think you got to have offensive people that are just as aggressive as the defensive people are. Or the more people you can get that have that type of temper, the better football team you're going to be from an offensive standpoint. A rampaging offense can ravage a defense. More than that, it can incite victory. I can remember in 1983, a key play for us in the St. Louis game was a 10-yard draw play that Billy Jackson ran in for a touchdown. That was as physical a run as we had all year. 
and the game was very much in doubt. It was very close, and Billy broke about four tackles and finally ran over one last tackler at the goal line to get in. That particular run changed the game for us. It really changed, and it was a physical type play. The ability to run with thunder instead of lightning made number 39 Larry Zonka the game's premier power runner during the early 1970s. When all else fails, and it's obvious that it's going to come down to a direct physical confrontation, I always thought it, it reflected a, a higher degree of intelligence to do the inflicting first. <laughs> was out into the open field where it was a man in the secondary. Obviously, I'd have an extreme size and weight advantage. Uh, generally, they were looking for a side shot rather than a head-on shot, simply because of the, the ratio of size, weight, and so on. But very often, if you would cut back directly into them, that element of surprise would completely discombobulate whatever they were trying to put together. And you'd be able to not only avoid the tackle, but lay in some devastating blows. I liked that style. I won't hide that. I, uh, I preferred to run inside. And my playing weight went from 235 in, in the early 70s to 250 or 255 in the latter part of the 70s because I was running inside. And it was kind of fun to meet head on. When I won, it was very rewarding. I didn't like it when I lost that battle. Zonka's lost confrontations were often as breathtaking as the many battles that he won. Drafted first by Miami in 1968, it wasn't until 1970 and the arrival of new head coach Don Shula that this down and dirty runner began leaving his impact on the NFL. Shula quickly found ways to exploit the Zonk speed and quickness, both of which were uncommon in a runner so large. And not since the days of Bronco Nagurski had the NFL experienced a runner with such punishing, tackle-breaking power. Even if you had an open shot to get him to hit him as hard as you could hit him, I always had the sense that I got the worst of the deal. I can remember some shots that I took on him one-on-one, -on -one, and, you know, I couldn't bring him down. You know, you need help. It's like trying to catch a runaway truck on in time when you see a bus and you put it on the side of a hill and uh, you didn't put your emergency brake on it and it starts to roll. We you know you're trying to grab it <laughs> and there's no way. Larry Zonka was a defensive back's worst nightmare. But he was a coach's dream. As a football coach, it's, it's tough to get attached to somebody uh, on a personal basis. But uh, it's tough not to get attached to a guy like Larry Zonka. To know him is to love him. A guy with a great sense of humor and on game day, uh, one of the toughest football players that I've ever been around. I think Larry had... 12 or 13 broken noses over his career, and uh, from week, week to week, it was, uh, you had to guess which side uh, of his face his nose would be lying on. I don't know why you bring my nose up. Is there something wrong with my nose? <laughs> he liked a little bit of blood dripping off his nose. He liked to look down and see himself filthy, dirty, because he now knows that he's playing the game. He's into it the, the way that he likes to be. And the, uh, the bigger the game, the better this guy played. In 1971, Larry Zonka personally carried the Dolphins to victory in the longest game in NFL history. One year later, Zonka's unrelenting power propelled the Dolphins to a victory over the Redskins in Super Bowl VII and a perfect 17-0 season. 
In 1973, Zonka capped off the Dolphins' second straight world championship by earning most valuable player honors for Super Bowl VIII. Throughout his career, Zonk played fullback like a horse plows a field, doggedly, with a high pain threshold, and with great determination. And I took a lot of pride in being a power running back. I think had I not had that little bit of speed and body control or whatever it was, that I would have probably ended up a middle linebacker. I know Dick Butkus, and he kids me about that on occasion. Uh, I don't see him too often anymore, but 10 years ago, back before he became a famous movie star, we, I managed to see him once in a while. It was interesting, back then, people called him Zonka. Now people ask me if I'm Butkus. <laughs> that bothers me. <laughs> Larry Zonka played pro football the way it was meant to be played from the beginning. But no other runner has powered down this crunch course, quite like Walter Payton of the Chicago Bears. Since this country first transformed rugby into football more than 100 years ago, no runner has run as far or punished more defenders than Walter Payton. I enjoy the contact of the game. You know, that's why I was brought up. <laughs> The hitting game and my position calls for not being hit. So when they hit you as hard as they can and then you pop back up, then they go, oh my God, I tried to kill this guy and I didn't hurt him. I just might as well, you know, I, it's gonna be like this all day. I just might as well just tackle him and get him down. Just getting Peyton down has never been as easy as it sounds. Over a decade, number 34 has been stiff-legging through the minefield at the line of scrimmage before exploding into the secondary. Coaches long ago recognized him as much more than another runner with a nifty stutter step and power. Walter Payton, normally if he's trapped at the end of a run, if you watch him, instead of him looking for a place to go, he will turn at that defender, and lots of times he's dishing out punishment. I mean, he'll take a shot at somebody even though he's got a ball in his hand. He's one of these guys that says, I'm gonna get you before you get me. And that's the way he plays. It's always within the rules. He just is going to get every inch he can. He doesn't like to run out of bounds with the football. And he's going to make the guy tackling him pay the price. And I think that's what it's all about. I mean, if the guy is willing to stick his nose in there, then he's got to feel what it's like really to tackle the best. off-season workouts are so grueling, they take over an hour to complete and more than a day to recover from. The NFL record book may never recover. He'll fight you, he'll test you, he'll give you his best and see what you've got for an answer. He's the king of hearts. In October of 1984, Walter Payton needed only 66 yards to become the game's all-time leading rusher. And he leaped at the chance to solidify his place in the history of the National Football League. Paul McMahon asked for quiet. Second play of the second half of the 21-yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation. Quick pitch to Walter. Looking for the record. Cuts back. He's got it. He's out of the 25 to the 26-yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher, surpassing Jim Brown. Walter Payton. 
one of a proud few who have conquered the NFL's crunch course. Yeah, but Brown left! Brown left! Some of the toughest, meanest men on the NFL's crash course played linebacker. Keep it up, stick them, stick it down her ears. Pittsburgh's Bill Saul, number 50, fit the mold perfect. That 24 is a little let's, let's wrap him. Even after the final gun sounded, Saul maintained his nasty disposition. Thank you. We're not allowed, boys. We're not allowed. Don't, don't, don't bug me. But Saul was a pussycat in comparison to the monstrous presence of Ray Nitschke. It wasn't a Jekyll Hyde presence. It was just Hyde. Uh, it was just total absence of any concern or compassion for another human being. During his 15 seasons with the Green Bay Packers, Nitschke proved that there was no room in a linebacker's personality for compassion. Nitschke played in a bloody rage, as did Chicago's Dick Butkus. Here we go, Andy. All right, we'll shift the 44 to a 56 stack pop. Butkus was that rarity in professional sports, an athlete who attained legendary status during his career. Butkus would follow a man up in the stands and hit him. He would, he would follow him up in the tunnel in the Coliseum. I've seen him do it. You run out of bounds, he's going to run right out with you. He honestly believed in the theory that, hey, if I can hit you hard enough, not only your hat will come off, but your head will come off. And he damn near tried to do that every time he hit somebody. I don't go to the movies too often, but uh, one particular movie that stands out in mind uh, it was uh, with Betty Davis. I think it was Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. I got kind of a charge when that head come rolling down the stairs. I kind of like to sit there and watch it, see things happen, and maybe uh, project those things happening on a football field, and not to me. He didn't like anybody with a different color jersey. I mean, he really disliked you. You know, he he went after you like he he hated you from his old neighborhood. He was the meanest son of a I've ever seen in my life play professional football. Dick Butkus was the greatest linebacker who ever played pro football. But the first to bring notoriety to the position was the New York Giants' Sam Huff, number 70. He was the subject of a TV documentary that demonstrated to millions that the linebacker's world was a violent one. What do you do that for, 88? You do that one more time, 88. I'm going to sock you one. Now, don't do that. You run again, you get a broken nose. Don't do that. Hit me on the chin with your elbow. Today's linebacker still inhabits a violent world. And interestingly enough, the game's best also wears a Giants uniform. Hey, 88, I'm not going to warn you no more now. He is number 56, Lawrence Taylor. Listen, look, we got to rush him. We got to kick the What we got to do is get in and get the All right, let's go. Come on now. Hey, we're a bunch of bad son of a Just play some ball. I really feel a linebacker has to type of person who keeps the team together. The linebacker has to be somewhere in, in the middle. He has to be tough enough to play the run, graceful enough to play the pass, and mean enough to knock a runner out. Woo! Woo! Just knowing we have to go out there and play is good enough for me to get ready to play a game. You know, I enjoy it, and that's what I look forward to every Sunday is going out there and playing football. Taylor not only terrorizes opponents, Let's go, he intimidates them. Yeah, 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 stick. Yeah, you mind. You mind, baby. He's got a relentless personality. Woo! Yeah, Mr. Ruffrey! Get on his butt! Get him, Ralph! Get him! He will stay on you, and he will stay after you. Hey, come on! The more threatened he feels, the more competitive he becomes. If I don't get four sacks tonight against this summer, dog, God, you mind, Ryan, you mind. It's a confidence born of demonstrated ability. He thinks that he can 
will anything to happen on the field. And for the most part, it's true. Homeboy, we can't play that stuff over here. Y'all gonna have to go to the other side. Lawrence Taylor's probably the best defensive player in the game, and you have to game plan to stop him. There's no doubt about it that, that he is that kind of player. You have to be ready to play against him. They grab him. They push him. They hold him. They double team him. And there are some who don't go by the book when trying to stop him. Leg with my in the sun. I'm gonna break his neck. He wait till I... Hey, Shula, you better hope I never get back in there. I will kick your And Lawrence Taylor can make good on a threat. Go get up. You didn't have to do that. Hey, you just, hey, you just play, baby. Just play. He's changed the game of football uh, because he's just so dominating. It used to be that you say, well, our back blocks him, and we go ahead and throw the pass. If you get a back block in Lawrence Taylor, you lose. You're going to lose a ball game, and it's been proven. He, he's beaten a lot of people. They start out blocking him with the back, and they move to a guard, and then they put the tackle on him. He runs over all of them, and he continues to run clear to the other side of the field and chase the play. You know, you expect the guy to dog it once in a while, you know? Uh, loaf from side to side, give up on a play, but he just does not do that. You really enjoy watching him play. I mean, he is a real joy to watch because the guy goes 150%. Like all great athletes, Taylor's playing style is a reflection of his personality. I play linebacker like my lifestyle is. You know, I'm pretty freewheeling, you may say, wild, abandoned, reckless, as the coach probably would say. Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs and have some fun. It suits me pretty well, and I enjoy it. Taylor's enjoyment comes at the expense of those who don't have quite as much fun when he's on the field. Son, I got to do better than this. Players like Lawrence Taylor prove that pro football will always be a hitter's game, a game of guts and guile, played by men who deserve the respect and admiration of fans everywhere. These men put their bodies on the line in the most demanding contact sport there is to travel the rugged landscape that is the NFL's Crunch Course.